Love it, love it, love it. Um, as Lori mentioned, I'll be in. Uh, I'll be flying into Slovenia in a couple weeks, heading down to Croatia. Uh, the churches and some of the parachurch organizations in Slovenia invited me to be their yearly retreat speaker. And this is the 500 year anniversary of the of the Protestant Reformation, and uh, it's just something awesome to recognize that uh, 500 years ago. A man by the name of Martin Luther and some other reformers, pastors, men who loved Christ, women who loved Jesus, just said, you know what, uh, there's, a, there's a different way to, to relate with God. And uh, it's not through being duty-bound, and it's not through obligation, it's not through giving, it's, it's solely by grace and grace alone. And that just set the world on fire, and this is the 500-year anniversary, and they asked me to come speak on the reformation of the heart and what that looks like in our lives as believers. There will be unbelievers there, there will be believers there. So pray for me as I go, uh, pray for my family as I leave them for a week, and uh, it's going to be exciting. So... Um, so just let, let you guys know that since Lori uh, already let the cat out of the bag. So uh, turn to Micah chapter 1. Micah chapter 1. We're going to cover five chapters this morning. It's going to go fast. It's going to be brisk. Get your running shoes on. Here we go. Uh, I was born a rebel. Yeah. Um, I know. It's hard to believe. Uh, suspend disbelief just for a moment, if you would. But I was born a rebel. And perhaps uh, the season of my rebelliousness was never so poignant as it was in my latter teenage years. Now, God gripped my heart and seized my life when I was 15 years old. That's when God chose to save me and my affections turned towards Jesus. But that doesn't mean all was well and good from that point forward. I bought my first car at age 16. It was a 1975 Volkswagen Scirocco. I bought it for $300. Yes, it wasn't the beauty of a car. It barely ran. I had to drop a new transmission in it. But once I got that new transmission in for $150, I had a car that ran for $450. This thing was oxidized. It was horrible to look at. It had damage all over, but it got me from point A to point B. One of the reasons why this car survived is because of all the bumper stickers I put on it. It really held the car together, all right? Now, one of the chief bumper stickers I had, front and center, actually was the first bumper sticker I put on my car. It said this, question authority. Well, I thought, man, I am a rock star having this bumper sticker on. I'm going to defy any sort of authority, authority figure, authority institution in my life, question authority. And a youth pastor at the time kind of stepped up and said, Scott, I don't know if this is an appropriate sticker to put on your car if you're going to call yourself a Christian. And, of course, with his encouragement, I said, yeah, whatever, right? Like, there was, there was this attitude in me that I was a rebel. I was going to question authority. Several years later, I went and saw a U2 in concert both nights at Sun Devil Stadium when they filmed the Rattle and Hum concert. $5 tickets. I was there both nights. The first night I was there, 20 rows back on the field of Sun Devil Stadium. They come out and play Where the Streets Have No Name, right? I was so pumped full of adrenaline. I mean, this is one of my favorite bands. I've seen them six times in concert. Amazing band. But there I was, 20 rows back on the field of Sun Devil Stadium, and I was on top of my my chair cheering and all of a sudden this police officer came over and said sir can you please step off the chair and I said something I'm not going to repeat in church to this police officer but I put my fist up and this guy was ready to arrest me until my dad who went with me who's a rock rock and roll enthusiast as well as you know you guys know where I get it from he pulled me off the chair and said you respect that officer I couldn't end up in jail I have not been to jail yet in my life, thank God. But that moment was really close. Again, there was something going inside me saying, screw authority. I don't care what kind of uh, outfit this uniform this guy's wearing. I'm going to do what I want to do. Take it a few years later. And the church I was a part of at the time was building a new facility. And uh, me and a friend thought it would be a great idea to break into the new church while it was under construction. Huge sanctuary, scaffolding, these huge uh, ceiling uh, bars going across. We threw a rope up as we broke into the church up on, the, on the roof and we're swinging like Tarzan back and forth through the sanctuary. No one ever found out about that. You asked me what church it was? I don't, I don't know. I forgot. All right. No, just kidding. 
I was, I was a punk. And I wasn't a punk before Jesus. I was a punk even after Jesus sees my heart. I am a rebel still. Even though God's brought me a long way, there's still something in me that, that bucks against authority. It's not because I'm just a firstborn. How many firstborns in here today? Yeah, you guys know what I'm talking about. Type A dominant personalities. But even secondborns can be rebellious. Amen? Yeah. How about thirdborns? Yep. Fourth? Now we're just getting into Mormon territory, all right? Beyond. <laughs> but here's the fact. While you sit there and you may hear my story and be like, wow, Scott, the grace of God surely is evident in your life, isn't it? Uh, we are all rebels. We are rebels before we meet Jesus, and somehow, some way, we're even rebels once Jesus captivates our hearts. There's something within us that wants to be our own authority. There's something in us that just says, you know what? Great suggestion, God, but I'd rather just go ahead and take this on my own. I clearly hear what you have to say. I clearly understand what you want me to do. But thanks, but no thanks. I'm doing okay just by myself. And here's the beautiful news for all of us who are rebels. God loves us even in our rebelliousness. God loves us so much in our rebelliousness that he will pursue us to get our attention. He will pursue us to, to, to turn our, our, our direction to the direction that, that now honors him and glorifies him and, and, and brings him delight. He works powerfully in the hearts of rebels like myself. And it's all because of one word, write it down, covenant. God operates in his love towards people by means of covenant. This is not contract love. This is covenant love. Because contract love is performance-based. Contract love says when you fail to meet the terms of the contract, there will be repercussions. The moment you rebel, you're out. The moment you rebel, you're cursed. The moment you rebel, you can sit, consider all the blessings for you gone. That's not how God operates. God operates out of covenant, which means it is an always present, ever steady, ever committed kind of love that is not based upon your performance, but based upon his devotion and dedication to you. Covenant-based relationship is what God offers us through Christ. It has nothing to do with us and all to do with him. But that doesn't mean we sit back on our lazy boy chairs and just take his grace for granted and just rely so heavily on his love that we act as if the journey with God doesn't matter. That is not right at all. See, my marriage to my wife is not based upon contract. It is based upon covenant. That's why when we got married 25 years ago, we didn't sign a 90-day contract. As long as I'm happy, we're okay, but I've got 90 days to get out of this thing. My love for my wife is based upon covenant, which means this. Contract says, as long as you make me happy, we're good. But the moment you stop making me happy, I'm out. So the question of contract love is, what's it going to take for me to get out of this relationship that I just don't like? Covenant says, I will walk with you through hell or high water, and it's not based upon how well we perform with each other. What matters is how we're going to work through the difficulties. So the question is not... What's it going to take for me to get out of this relationship? The question is, what's it going to take for me to make this relationship better? That's covenant. And thank goodness, we're talking about two fallible creatures here, husband and wife, who are just trying to figure out what covenant love looks like. 25 years later, we're still committed to one another, only by the grace of God. But how much more deliberate and dedicated is God's love for us, knowing that we are rebels, knowing that we are sinners, knowing that we do make mistakes, that God is ever committed to us. So much so, when he made the covenant with his people through Abraham, 
He walked through the sacrifices alone without Abraham being a part of this covenant because God said every stipulation of this covenant covenant will be based upon my commitment to you, Abraham, even though I know you will fail me. And even though we fail, and even though we mess up, and even though we are rebels, God still loves those whom he calls his own. Amen? This is the message of Micah. I'm going to tell you, Micah is this guy, this prophet, who comes to the people of Israel and tells them of their rebelliousness. He's a guy who comes and reminds the people of, of God of their re- rebellion, their disobedience, and he reminds them of the covenant love God has for them. And what that covenant, covenant love reminder does, it should restore in us a joy for the things that makes God joyful. Covenant love reminder should show us the error of our ways and turn us in repentance back to a God who is ever faithful to us, even though we are faithless at times. So Micah, that's his message, not just to the people of Israel, but for us today. So here is my encouragement to you. No matter how far you've wandered, no matter how far you've strayed, no matter how much you've been disobedient, no matter how much disregard you've had for the the will and the ways of the Lord, today is the day of renewed devotion to a covenant-loving God. Today is the day to say, I refuse to have idols in my life. I refuse to have false gods in my life, which demand from me loyalty, but give me nothing but bondage. And return back to a covenant-keeping God who has promised me he will never leave me or forsake me. And a God who says, you bend your will to mine, you submit to me, and you will find freedom for your life. Micah, whose name literally means, who is like God? We don't know if this was his real name. Because he was a prophet who ministered for 30 years among hard-hearted people. And perhaps the clarion call of his ministry was the statement, who is like God? Who's going to love you like God? Who's going to treat you like God? Who's going to bless you like God? He was a man who continued to point people to God, and perhaps his name finally became that which is known today, Micah. Who is like God? And that's the question. Who is like God? Because when you study the God of Micah and the study of the God of the Old and New Testament, you will discover that there is no one like him. Because he is supreme in awesome splendor. He is supreme in glorious might. He is supreme in unending love. And when you experience the God of Scripture, you too will declare, who is like God? I'm going to tell you something interesting about Micah perhaps one of the most difficult prophets to to communicate and to talk about because for seven chapters, Micah is all over the map when it comes to topics. I wish it was nice and neat and orderly and he just moved from one topic to the next, but I'm going to tell you over 30 years of ministry, what I think we have is a condensed mix of visions he received from God and he just threw them out there. And I spent this week kind of wrestling through these seven chapters going, God, how do I best share the message of Micah with our people? And I believe the things we're going to talk about today and next week best reflect the heart of the book. So there's three things we're going to talk about. And it goes back to the covenant love theme. And it's this. Covenant love sees sin as severe. Number two, covenant love sees people as precious. And number three, covenant love sees deliverance as definite. Chapters one through five, we're going to cover those this morning. So are you guys ready? Here we go. Covenant love sees 
sin as severe. If you want to write down a passage that might help you understand a little bit the, uh, the idea of God's covenant commitment to us, Deuteronomy chapter 28, 29, 30, uh, the most quoted book by Jesus. It was Jesus' favorite book, Deuteronomy. Uh, the message of Deuteronomy can be summarized this way. As God's people, there will be blessing for obedience and cursing for disobedience. That's the message of, of Deuteronomy. I'm going to tell you, that's the message of Scripture. That God says, you obey me. And when you obey me, not out of duty, but out of delight because of what I've done for you, walk in my ways, be holy as I'm holy, I will bless you. I will make your life better. But if you walk in disobedience, if you have a disregard for my will and my ways for your life, there's nothing but cursing. And if you're in Christ, you can still be disobedient, right? Just because you love Jesus and know Jesus doesn't mean you're all well and good and you can just live life however you want as, and, and really live in such a way with a disregard to the, the salvation that's been given to you through Jesus by God's grace. Hebrews chapter 12 says, What child of God, son or daughter, thinks they can live a life of sin and not experience discipline from him because he's a, he's a good, loving, kind father? I don't allow my children to live like little hellions, all right? My kids understand the importance of, of rules. They understand the importance of convictions and principles. And they know I love them, and they know I'm a tender dad, but they also know that I'm not going to let them get away with things that I've clearly told them not to do. Doesn't mean they're out of the family. Sometimes it comes close. But what it means is that there will be discipline for disobeying what we want for them. And it's not because the things we want for them are going to rob them of joy. The things we want for them are going to allow their joyful experience of life to be that much more. So there's blessings for obedience. There's cursings for disobedience. And I will tell you that God's people throughout Scripture are not always those who just attend church, who, who pray, who read the Bible. You can attend church, read the Bible, and pray and not be God's child. See, in the Old Testament, there's a term, and it comes up several times in Micah, called the remnant. No, that wasn't the last Leonardo DiCaprio movie. That was the revenant. <laughs> Fantastic movie, but that's another story for another time, all right? Write down the remnant. Because not all of Israel were truly Israel, the scripture says. Not all of Abraham's offspring are truly Abraham's kids. Because it didn't matter the external devotion you showed, it mattered the internal transformation that was lived out through your behaviors and your attitudes. And in the Old Testament, God's people weren't always ones who loved him with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. God said even within Israel, there was a core group that truly loved him, and that's what he called the remnant. Just because you, just because you come to church doesn't mean you're a Christian. Just because you read the Bible doesn't mean you're a believer. Just because you pray, just because you give, just because you go see the shack ten times doesn't mean you're a Christian. You can live in a, a barn that doesn't make you a cow, amen? So the principle is this. We are not to be preoccupied with external devotions, religious activity. What matters is what is going on inside of your heart and how that is compelling you to live for the glory of God. So Micah has a strong word against those who think they can live lives of a of rebellion and still think they're in with God's good graces. See, God treats sin as severe, so much so the opening scene we have in Micah is this. Look at verse 1. The word of the Lord came to Micah in the days of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. Those are three kings that reigned in successive order for 30 years. He shared the prophetic word from God, the warnings of judgment, to Jotham, to Ahaz, to Hezekiah, the first two kings disregarded the message. 
Hezekiah repented and led the people back to God, but it was too late in the sense of suffering the consequences, and thus the Babylonians came in and took Israel into captivity. But what's interesting about Hezekiah is what Jeremiah refers to in Jeremiah 26. Write it down, look at it later. Jeremiah says to the king at the time, turn from your rebellion, turn from your wickedness. Remember what Micah did with Hezekiah and how Hezekiah changed? That's what I want us to do. Jeremiah refers to Micah and his faithfulness and the fact that Hezekiah changed the course of that nation's trajectory as a result of Micah's faithful preaching of the truth of God. And so for 30 years, Micah's preaching this message, and he can't help but start with what God is going to do. Verse 2, hero peoples, all of you listen to earth and all that it contains. This is for everybody. And let the Lord God be a witness against you, the Lord from his holy temple. This is a judicial scene. Not that, you know, you're going to be able to stand trial. Like you're going to have someone who's going to defend you accurately and appropriately. God says he's coming down as judge. He's coming down as jury. He's coming down with an indictment. And it's not going to be pretty. Verse 3. For behold, the Lord is coming forth from his place. Now watch as he comes down. This is not some like genie floating down on his cloud, coming down to, to the earth and saying, hey, it's time for me to settle accounts. Everyone pay attention now. That's not what this is going to be like. He will come down and tread on the high place of the earth. The mountains will melt under him. The valleys will be split beneath him like wax before fire, like water poured down from a steep place. All this because of the rebellion of God's people. This is going to be powerful. This is going to be sorrowful. Because people have been given enough to be accountable for, and God will one day reckon accounts. And he will come, and his coming will be obvious. It will be purposeful. He will come to judge. And the rest of chapter 1 deals with what he has against Samaria, the northern tribe of Israel, and what he has against Judah, the southern gathering of the tribes of Israel. Everyone has fallen short of what God has required. Judgment is coming. And Micah can't help but feel for these people because not only are they his countrymen, but these are also people from his hometown and some from his own family. And he is the bearer of this news. And the message is clear. You do not treat sin like a little puppy dog. Sin is severe. And if you don't understand the severity of sin, look at the cross of Christ. That God had to punish sin, and he didn't spare even his own son to take the penalty for all those who would believe. Sin is severe. And twice over the past couple of weeks, I've come across a, a funny, but yet it should stop us dead in our tracks, example of how we treat sin. Go ahead and, and throw the, 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 uh, the, the picture up. I've seen this in the stores, and I've seen this online. So what we have with Easter coming as far as preparations for Easter is candy galore. And what we have as far as uh, 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 an example of some of this candy, we have it up there. There it is. Look at this. So we've got Noah's Ark Easter egg hunt. So isn't this cute? You've got little creatures smiling. And, and not only are they little creatures that are smiling, but inside each one you've got some candy, right? Now I'm looking at this. I'm going, how many people are walking through the store and they see, oh, this would be perfect for my child, right? To have them open up something on Easter. It's the Noah's Egg Easter Egg Hunt. And, and, and I'm just going to ask you guys, because I think you're somewhat biblical literate. Um, what was the main issue with Noah's Ark? What was, what was the problem God had with the world at the time? Sin. And what happened to the world during the time of Noah's Ark? Destroy, that's putting it mildly. 
Millions of people died in unbelief because God saw that evil was so rampant on the earth that he destroyed everybody except for eight people. God did not send the flood because the animals were too cute on the planet, right? Um, God did not send the flood because all of us are filled with sweet and good things inside, right? I'm thinking to myself, here is an example of how we treat sin. We candy coat it, we, we throw some paint on it, we make it cute, when in reality, that thing should be filled with dead corpses because that best articulates what happens at Noah's Ark. Parents-to-be, do not paint your children's rooms with the theme of Noah's Ark unless you're going to be accurate and display what the Ark was really about. I'm being sarcastic, but I'm being serious as well. Because we approach things like this and we want to cutesify, yes, that's a made-up word, the fact that God is a God who not only extends grace, but he's a God who brings judgment. Noah's Ark was about judgment. Noah's Ark was about sin. Noah's Ark took out the lives of millions of people with only eight surviving, and those eight only by the grace of God. How do we cutesify sin in our lives? Oh, you know what? I can take a little bit from, from my workplace. It's okay. They're not going to miss it. Oh, I can treat my husband with, with a little bit of an attitude and, and disrespect maybe some of his leadership in our home. Oh, you know what? I can talk like a trucker, and you know, God will forgive me at the end of the day. You know, I can, I'm not going to talk about driving the speed limit because I'm guilty in that area, so we'll pass by that one. You know, I don't have to love my neighbor as I love myself. There's so many things that are sin in our lives that we justify, we polish over, and we'd rather excuse our own sin by pointing out other people's more blatant sins. And all I know is that I pray for myself and I pray for my family, I pray for you, that we would have hearts that not only honor God, but our lives would be lived in such a way where it reflects the glory of Christ and the power of what he's doing in all of us who are works in progress. Amen? We don't gloss over sin. God doesn't. He treats sin as severe. See, some of the things he's going to point at in the book of Micah is the fact that people were greedy. People treated uh, other people as, as just commodities to make themselves richer, to make themselves more popular. They treated the poor and the oppressed with such a lack of civility and human dignity. They stole from the church. They stole from the poor. These were people that did not live by the truth. And if one thing I know for certain is that what God wants for his people is for you to not just be truth believing, but for all of us to be truth living. Time magazine this week, on the cover, the cover is this, truth is dead. Because of all the stuff that this current administration is putting forth as far as fake news. Well, the world does not know what it can trust anymore. The world sees things p come up on their, on their feeds. Is this true? Is this real? What do we believe? All I know is that there may be a world of fake news out there, or there may be a world of true news out there. I don't know, but the only good news and the only eternal news and the only news that makes a difference is the news that comes via the voice of God, which we have in our scriptures. That is the truth. And Jesus says, when you love the truth and know the truth, that truth will set you free. We take sin seriously because God treats it severely. And praise God for the cross of Christ who dealt with the sin issue once and for all. He made him who knew no sin to become sin for us so that we may have eternal life. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Amen. So Micah says you need to understand God treats sin severely. Second point, but covenant love also sees people as precious. Here's the message of grace that comes out, even though it's in a context of extreme disappointment with two groups of people. 
There's the sins of the powerful people, and then there's the sins of the spiritual leaders. Chapter 2, chapter 3. Look at chapter 2. Mike is concerned with this group because the, the, the commandments of God have always been to take care of, of one another. Matter of fact, the Ten Commandments given to mankind, not so that we can measure up at the end of the day and check off the Ten Commandments and say, hey, I'm good. But the Ten Commandments were given to show us how far we fall short of what God requires. And only by His grace do we have something to aim for now in Christ. First four of the Ten Commandments had to do with our loyalty to God, and the last six have to do with our obedience and taking care of one another as people. Jesus summed it up in two ways. Love God, love your neighbor. And you don't do one without the other. If you're not loving God, you're not going to love your neighbor. And if you think you're not loving your neighbor, well, you're not really truly loving God. See, Jesus encapsulated in such an amazing way, yet it's so much more difficult to live out, isn't it? You say you love God and hate your neighbor, well, your love for God's a sham. But you say you love your neighbor, but you don't love God, well, that love is also a sham. Both operate concurrently with each other. There's a holistic approach we have when it comes to loving God and loving others. It's not like, oh, I got to love God first before I love other people. No, 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 no. It's all one holistic, organic package. Micah says in, in chapter 2, look at, Woe to those, verse 1, who scheme iniquity, who work out evil on their beds. When morning comes, they do it, for in the power of their hands, they covet fields and seize them. They take houses away from people. They rob a man in his house, a man in his inheritance. Therefore, says the Lord, I'm planning against his family a calamity from which you cannot remove from your necks, and you will not walk haughtily. There's haughtily, there's pride, there's greed. People are looking to line their own pockets at the expense of other people. All I know for sure is that God says you're to take care of people, especially the poor and the oppressed. You are not given positions of power and you're not given wealth to use it for your own advantage. You are given what you're given to help others. Skip to verse 6. Do not speak out. This is what the other people are saying to Micah. Quit preaching. Don't you guys want to say that to me sometimes? Quit talking, because these people are comfortably casual with God, and they're thinking that his message is way off track. Quit your preaching. Are we not good with God? Verse 6, skip to verse 8. Recently, my people have arisen as an enemy. You strip the road off the garment, the unsuspecting passerbys, from those who return from war. The women of my people you evict, each one from her pleasant house, and her children you take my splendor away forever. So verse 2 is against people of affluence, people of influence, people of power. And he says, you've been nothing but compelled by greed. And here's my question for us this morning. How are we leveraging our time and our treasures and our talents for the sake of other people? And how are we leveraging the things that have been given to us by God's grace so that other people's lives can be improved? How can we make others better? We need to have an eye towards those who sometimes don't look like us, don't act like us, who don't believe the same way, but that's not the stipulations God puts on it. He says, you see someone in need, you would take care of it. You see someone hungry, you feed them. You see someone thirsty, you see someone naked, you clothe them. But it is time for the men and women who truly love God to stop making themselves richer and greedier and more powerful and start to extend the message of Christ sometimes through our demonstrable works and our activities to make other lives better. Philippians chapter 2, did not Jesus come down from the riches of heaven, laid aside his riches, became a bondservant, dwelt among us? Why? Because he came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. How are we helping improve the lives of others? Think about the coworker that you know has need. Think about the neighbor you know that has need. Fill in the blank, only you know what it is, but perhaps you can stave off the desire to have that 70-inch 4K UHD TV and go line the pantries of someone who's hungry this week. Perhaps you can hold off on getting that new import car that you're just so chomping at the bit to have so that that coworker can have something, a car repair that only costs a couple hundred bucks. 
have an eye towards helping others because it's your proclamation of Jesus that's important, but it's also your demonstration of his grace and love in other people's lives that's also important. We have a lot to be accountable for, people. We live in a nation that is far better than most in this world. You are among the world's top 2% of the wealthiest people in the world. Go to, go to globalrichlist.com sometime. Enter your salary. You think you're poor, you're among the world's wealthiest 2%. Most people live off less than $2 a day. In light of that, you're doing okay, aren't you? Don't make me call you Rockefeller or Kennedy, okay? I might. But God will hold us accountable for how well we have used the the resources he's given to us, whether we've spent them lavishly on ourselves or we've blessed others to make their lives better. Amen? And then he shifts in chapter 3 to the spiritual leader. The men who were put in positions of authority to lead the people in the right direction, and yet even the spiritual leaders of the day did not regard the will of God something to honor. Look at chapter 3. And he says to these people, verse 2, you hate good and love evil. Does that seem backwards to you? It should. Because here are the people who are supposed to guide the nation spiritually. Here's the moral compass of the people. And yet they have chosen to lead their lives by hating good and loving evil. Why? What you're going to discover is because they really did it because of the wine and the beer that was being offered to them. Now imagine the pastor out there on the corner say, hey, we'll preach for beer and wine. Don't worry, I haven't done that ever in my life. There's a rebel in me that kind of wants to, but I'm not going to do it. Because these men would satisfy their appetites by preaching a message of what people wanted to hear, not what they needed to hear, all because the wine and the beer was, was stellar. And these men failed to be obedient to the Lord. And because they failed to honor God in guiding the nation spiritually, look what God says he will do. Verse 4, they will cry out to me, but I will not answer them, and I will hide my face from them because they have practiced evil deeds. Do not take the silence of God in your life as evidence of something he may be approving of. It is a scary thing to fall in the hands of a living God, and it's even scarier to not be able to discern his voice when he's clearly trying to get your attention. Look at verse 7 and 8. The seers will be ashamed, the diviners will be embarrassed, indeed they will cover their mouths because there is no answer from God. And yet... The courage from Micah being a man who is sensitive to the things of God. Look at verse 8. Look what he says. This is like his resolve, right, to keep going. On the other hand, I am filled with power, with the spirit of the Lord, and with justice and courage to make known the sins of my people. Here's a man who just says, you know what, God? He's not boasting. He's not being prideful. He's saying, my reliance is solely on the spirit and the power of God. And it's only that he's able to give me courage in the midst of such a rebellious culture right now. See, when there's voices that say, shut up, when there's critics that say, be silent, when there's people that say, stop preaching, when there's people saying, your teaching's too hard, when there's people that say, the Bible says this, but I'm going to live my life like this. Micah says, I'm going to persevere because blessing follows obedience and cursing follows disobedience. It's a tough message. You don't know how many times I, I'm preparing a message during the week, and I'm like, God, can I just teach the five ways to be happy? Can't we just always talk about John 3, 16, for God so loved the world? Can't we just always talk about the six ways to financial peace? Can we always just, we can't. I have a responsibility to not just talk about the grace and the love and the mercy of God, which are incredible and rich, and powerful, but I'm also called for us to reflect on the holiness 
and righteous of God, where we sit there and go, I'm not going to take the love he's given me for granted. I'm not going to abuse his grace. I'm not going to say I'm a Christian and live my life like anything. But there's a term, and this is the only big $10 theological term I'm going to give you this morning, I promise. Antinomianism. Don't even try to write it down. But what it means is this. There are people who claim to love God and their lives reflect anything but a love for God. Why? Because they're anti-law. Anti-namas. Paul talked about this in Romans 6 where he addressed people who wanted to abuse the grace of God. Because guess what? I'll go out and deliberately sin because I know gr the grace of God will always forgive me. That is a dead end path to living because he says, are we to sin so that God's grace may increase? May it never be. We live lives in reflection to the holiness of who God is. That's why he says, be holy as I'm holy. We are to embrace righteousness, and we are to continue to grow in the manner and likeness of Jesus. That's the love of God that is present in the life of his kids. Not a rebellious, obstinate heart that says, thanks for the salvation, and then live your lives like hell. That's not what God wants for his children. And if you continue in the course where you abuse his grace, I'm going to tell you, you're not part of the remnant community. The person that has no sensitivity to the will of God is a person who is out of the will of God and perhaps out of God's family. If you do not have the disciplining hand of God on your life, if you continue to walk in the ways of disobedience and there's no sensitivity to it, it is evidence that you're not truly in to begin with. This is why Jesus says, do not substitute external activity for knowing me, right? This is why Jesus says, you come to me and say, did I not do this in your name? Did I not feed people? Did I not clothe people? And Jesus says, depart from me, for I never knew you, because knowing implies relationship. And I am married back to covenant love of my wife. I love my wife. There's some days she doesn't love me, but she's committed to me. Notice I didn't say I don't love her. I, I love her all the time. There's some days she doesn't like me. Like, like, maybe just a little bit. But it is covenant love that says, you know what? Because we operate out of the sense of delight for one another and not duty, we are not obligated bound, but we understand the importance of health in our relationship. We do things for the other because we want what's best for the other person. There's something that compels us from soft hearts of flesh towards one another. And it's the same way with God. We don't operate out of this duty-bound, performance-based religion. We operate because, boy, he has affected us with such incredible love, not sparing even his own son. I am not going to take that for granted, but I'm going to live my life for his glory and his honor, however imperfectly, every single day. Do not take the grace of God for granted. Because guess what? There are people sitting here right now this morning that think they're in and they're not. Because for them, relationship with God means an hour and a half on Sunday mornings. Did my duty! God doesn't want your duty. He wants your heart. And you know the evidence of him having your heart? you're sensitive to his will throughout the week. This is good. This is important. But this is the cherry on top of a Sunday that's been building all week long. Amen? It's hard to think that probably most people sitting in our churches right now have no clue about the love of Jesus. Singing their songs, giving their money, reading their Bibles, and yet God says, your hearts are far from me. Return. All because of misplaced trust. All because of misplaced hope. Now that we all feel good about ourselves, last point. Covenant love 
sees deliverance as definite. There's hope for all of us. This is the good news, right? The good news is there is hope for all of us, and the hope is not in your activity. The hope is not in your performance. The hope is in a God who promises to deliver his people now and forever. Two points here. There's the kingdom of the delivered, and there's the king of the delivered. Future hope instills present encouragement. Future hope instills present encouragement. Keep going, keep doing it. But secondly, future hope activates present holiness. Those are two bonus points I want to give you. Future hope instills present encouragement, the perseverance, the tenacity to keep doing what God wants you to do. Even when your friends don't want it, even when your families don't want it, even when there's critics all around you saying, don't do it, you keep doing it because it's what the love of Jesus compels you to do because it's what compelled him to do what he did. Future hope instills present encouragement, but also future hope inspires present holiness. What God has awaiting me should affect the way I live right now, and that should be to be holy as he is holy. Because chapter 4 and chapter 5, amazing. Chapter 4. The coming kingdom. Just look at a couple of verses real quick. And it will come about in the last days, verse 1, and the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains. Meaning, early on in Micah, God has laid waste to all the mountains, but there will be one mountain erected and one kingdom that will reign higher and, and be supreme over higher uh, on any mountaintop. That is his mountain raised above the hills. The peoples will stream to it. Many nations will come and say, come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of God of Jacob, that he will teach us about his ways, that we will walk in his paths, and from Zion, Zion will go forth the law, even the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, and he will judge between many peoples and render decisions for mighty and distant nations, and they will hammer their swords into plowshares, no more warfare but peace, and their spears into pruning hooks. There will be agricultural bustling going on, and nation will not lift up sword against nation, and never again will they train for war. They will sit under their own vine, they will sit under their own fig trees. This is a picture of pre-fall, Eden-like living that God has promised to restore with his kingdom. The people of God will gather. The word of God will nourish his people, and this will be for all peoples, all tribes, all tongues and nations who bow their knee to Jesus. This is a picture of the future kingdom that is coming. Awesome. There will be peace, not the peace that the world gives, not that the peace that the false prophets or the false teachers or false pastors tell you. This is peace that's only found in the Prince of Peace, i.e. Jesus, and this will come through him via his kingdom, and Micah 4 is a picture of that coming kingdom. But you can't have the kingdom without a king, chapter 5, and I close with this. Perhaps one of the most Referenced prophecies of the coming Messiah, Micah 5 talks about he who is coming. Now muster yourselves and troops, daughters of troops that have laid siege against us. With a rod they will smite the judge of Israel on the cheek. Did that not happen with Jesus? But as for you, Bethlehem, too little to be among the clans of Judah. From you will go forth for me to be ruler in Israel. His goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. Therefore, he will give them up until the time when she who is in labor has borne a child, and the remainder of his brethren will return to the sons of Israel. He will arise and shepherd his flock. And in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, they will remain, because at that time he will be great to the ends of the earth. And it goes on, but I'm going to stop there because... Bethlehem was an insignificant city. 
And God does things through insignificant places and insignificant people so that he will receive the glory and he will receive the honor. See, God does not do things so that you can get the credit. He does things so that he can get the glory. That's why he showed himself more powerful than Egypt's gods, right, with the Exodus. This is why he showed himself more powerful than, than the Babylonian gods when Daniel and his friends and the people were allowed to go back and rebuild their city. God does what he does so that you can't vouch for anything. You can't take the credit, but only he can get the glory. And praise God that he has secured the safety and protection and security of his people by means of his son, the coming ruler that Micah talked about years in advance and says, he is coming. This ruler that they will smite on the cheek, this ruler who will be born in this town, Bethlehem, this ruler that will offer security and peace and protection for his people. There is the entrance to the kingdom. It is through the king himself. More about this next week as we finish Micah 6 and 7. But I want you to know that Believing in the king and the promise of the kingdom is guaranteed. I was listening to NPR radio yesterday, as is habit. I know, I love Jesus, listen to NPR. How the two are reconciled, I don't know. But they're doing their pledge drive right now. And they said, hey, if you call in the next hour, you get your name put into a drawing for a $1,000 Apple gift card. And then one of the announcers said this. So here's what we want you to do. Call, make the donation, get your name entered into the drawing, and start dreaming on how you're going to spend that $1,000 Apple gift card. And I said, start dreaming. Why? So that those dreams can be ultimately dashed because the odds of winning the gift card are so against me? <laughs> but don't we do that? Don't we go, oh, yeah, I'm going to do that. I'm going to start dreaming, and then it doesn't happen. How many people have dreams dashed on a daily basis because they're putting their faith in something that may never plan out or play out in their lives? My encouragement to you is to be dreamers. But instead of dreaming in subjective reality and what can only maybe happen by chance, start dreaming in the guarantee of the king who's already come and the kingdom that is yet coming that he has promised that will be for sure, because as sure as the first coming of Christ happened and he did what he said he was going to do, the second coming and the kingdom coming is guaranteed as well. Start dreaming about that. And, and instead of dreaming, act. Love this king. Show a devotion to this king. Live as though you're a citizen of this future kingdom. Evidence in your life a passion for the things he's passionate about. And may people go, you obey a different king, don't you? May your life be so marked with his characteristics and his behaviors and his mannerisms, you're saying, you know what, this world will come and go, but I'm preparing myself for another kingdom that will last forever. That's how you start dreaming. But dreaming only happens when you start living. Amen? Let's stand, let's pray. Father, thank you for the message of Micah. Thank you for a morning to celebrate so much, Lord. And, and again, the, the things that we celebrate have their core in how incredibly gracious and generous you are. Thank you, Father, for loving us in our rebelliousness. Thank you for loving us in our disobedience. Thank you for being a voice that calls us back from the, from the cliff's edge, from those, those points of danger, and I pray that today is the day of salvation. For those that have never known Jesus, may today be the day they start that journey with the Lord and the Savior, the King of, of, of Micah chapter 5. And for those of us who have maybe flirted with sin, perhaps today is the day of conviction that we will choose to no longer dabble, but we will continue to now press on towards living a life of holiness and righteousness, because that's what pleases you, Father. Thank you for salvation in Christ. Thank you for loving us when we're unlovable. And to you be the glory forever and ever. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord continue to lift his face towards you and give you his peace and his grace and mercy forever and ever. Have a great day. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye.